Hello and welcome back to You Want to Do What with Dan and Julie. Today we have Samantha and Tamara on who are antiques dealers. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you doing? Good. Um, so do you want to give an, uh, an introduction uh, uh, about what you do and, and how, what you're doing? Sure. Um, well, I'm Sam um, and I uh, am a vintage and antiques uh, dealer. Um, and I have my own business called Vintage Creator Interiors. Um, and together with Tamara, we have a business called Your Antique Sourcing Studio and also an online events uh, fair called Virtual Vintage Fair. So, um, yeah, very much uh, sort of ensconced in the vintage and antiques world. Um, and that's me and Tamara. Uh, hi. Tamara and I uh, also have my own uh, vintage and antique business called Reclectic Vintage Interiors. I, I have an online shop and uh, before lockdown we'd run pop-up events as well and as Sam said together we, we have your antique sourcing studio where we source for uh, private clients and for designers and uh, commercial and um, interior designers. And, and virtual vintage fair is something we started just before lockdown, which has been amazing for a group of 35 dealers to, to showcase all their pieces while all the fairs and markets were cancelled in the last few months. Oh, that's a great idea. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll jump onto that a bit later. So, um, Samantha, do you want to tell us how you actually got into the antiques world? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm sure there are people that are sort of born and bred into the antiques world, but I wasn't, although I have to say it is in my blood because my mother was a, an antiques dealer. She used to sell Ali Pali and she was very much into the whole kind of upcycling um, kind of decoupage thing in the 80s. Was it 90s? I can't remember yeah. now. Um, <laughs> so she, she, that was very much part of my sort of childhood if you like um but I went to I was in retail for a few years um in West End and then I went to university and read English then I went into corporate banking a, a very circuitous route um and then I worked in jewelry for quite a long time after I started my family and then I left uh, jewellery and decided that um, because I have a house in France to start bringing French um, decorative pieces back into the UK to sell. And that's how I got into it, really. I, I, I mean, I've always been into interiors. I also have an interior consultancy business as well, where I help mm -hmm. to style and um, design their homes. Uh, so it's, it's a bit of a portfolio career. Too. Yeah, quite a few different, different things going on there. Definitely, um, but increasingly much more focused on the antiques and vintage, particularly since Tamara and I teamed up and we established your antique sourcing studio, which is, as she said, a much more sort of corporate focused um, business. So, so yeah, that's how I got into it, really. Just, uh, you know, it's, it's taken a few years, but I've, I've found my passion. So what was school like for you? Did you sort of, were you artsy or how was it? I think I was artsy, but I, I, I didn't really, um, I did a lot of drama. Um, I did a lot of acting and I did a lot of music. So I was very much on the creative side, but it wasn't a terribly creative school. Um, and so I didn't do art, but actually I probably should have done a, uh, an art foundation. I think if you have any creative bone in your body, my advice to you would be to do a an art foundation. Because if you end up in any artistic career or job you know having the discipline of being able to put a sketchbook together and and sort of you know have a have a creative sort of mindset is is really useful um so I suppose coulda shoulda woulda I would have liked to have done that mm. but I did um I hit history English and biology of all things <laughs> a bit different I, and I failed biology. I didn't fail it, but I didn't do very well. <laughs> oh, I, I, I did the exact same thing. So don't oh, worry. it was hideous. <laughs> hideous. It was such a wrong choice. And I just yeah. wasn't really given a very, I, I suppose, a, I was at a, a, a mixed school, but it was kind of mixed, but not mixed. And, you know, it was back in the, God, when were we at school? 
80s. 80s, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the 80s. Um, so yeah, and then I went on to do to university to do English, and I loved that. And actually, I think if if looking back, if I'd made a different decision, I probably would have ended up being an academic. But you know, love. The, my first love was calling, and you know, I didn't do it. So there mm-hmm. we go. <laughs> okay. And so uh, tomorrow, was it a similar uh, journey for you? Uh, no, very different, actually. I, I grew up in South Africa and uh, I always, my family always collected antiques and vintage. So we always had in our home, but um, the access to it wasn't as great. So there'd be a few antique fairs and markets, you know, a few times a year or little shops in various places that I'd always go to with my mom. And I always... I always adored history. History was always a passion for me at school. Mm. It's not something I studied at university, which I can't understand why I didn't, because I actually studied (laughs) law, of all things. Wow, Um, a bit different. Yeah, very different. And I did English as well. But I went on to do law and then a postgraduate degree in law as well. And then I came to to live in England um, and worked in a law firm for a while. And then I actually went to work in advertising for most of my career. Um, and eventually I followed my love of history and antiques and I (laughs) eventually took a while, (laughs) took a number of years. Um, I went to do a a year's course at the V&A museum on decorative art history, uh, which was absolutely incredible. And it was quite immersive as well, you know, walking around all the, um, the exhibits with lecturers. It was fantastic. And that really, um, just inspired me and, I, I started with an, an Etsy shop selling, just thought, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd go with it. And it really developed from there. And mm. um, I absolutely love what I do. I, I, I love the history side of it, the, the research, the, you know, the intrigue, the story. Mm. of it, it inspires me when I look at pieces just to, to do quite a lot of research. But as Sam said, when we came together, it's also taken a whole new, new route, which is mm. we both have our separate businesses and our businesses together. And it's just, um, it's a joy. I, I can definitely relate to you with the, the history aspect, what you're doing. There's a, a really great uh, antique center uh, around where we live in Essex. It's up at near Battlesbridge. Um, and we walk around that quite often. And some of the little, the trinkets and stuff, the history that goes with them. Yeah. It's just fascinating. Yes. Uh, really into that. Um, so with you going into different uh, different sort of areas and you're into antiques now, how much do you really need to know about art and, and sculpture and to sort of... And the history as well. Yeah, to, to get into it. I think, I don't think you have to know a lot I th- in the sense of if you go into very high-end antiques, possibly, but everything's available online. If you're mm. unsure, just look it up. I mean, mm. it's, you know, if you're if you're kind of know how to use a computer you'll be fine but i think i think you i think tomorrow and i come at it from slightly different perspectives tomorrow comes at it from a very sort of historical that's what's that's the the trigger for her whereas the trigger for me is an aesthetic one Mm. um and i tend to choose the pieces that i buy and sell or that i advise my clients to get on a on a more of an emotional connection around well does that bring you joy does that bring you happiness when you look at that piece? Does it, you know, does it trigger your endorphins? Mm. Um, and I think anybody that's in a sort of, I came at it from, a, you know, an interiors perspective, i.e. helping Pete clients to make their homes feel special and curated in a way that, for example, in my house, I remember every piece that I bought and why I bought it. Wow. Because for me, it's a connection. Mm. It's, it's, I th- it's important to know and understand why that says something to you. So, so, so I, the short answer to your question is, do you need to know much? No, but you have to believe, you have to be passionate about it. Yeah, and I think, I think that's right. And I think whatever angle you come from, um, you know, I may look at the story and history, but, but the aesthetics of it, you know, are as important, mixing different styles, different eras. I mean, for both of us, we don't have, you know, we don't say we focus on 19th century or 20th century. It's a mix of what speaks to us and we think will work in a home or whatever we're sourcing for. And I think that's right. I don't think you have to have um, specific 
education on it, but there has to be a love, a passion, without a doubt. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, my my next question to the pair of you would have been: Do you have a special a specialized area or something, or even like you said, style? Do you what what is the sort of style that you do prefer? Um, I think we do them. have our own. We do have our own styles. I think most antiques dealers have their own style. Um, or they have a have a particular area that they focus on. For example, it might be art, or it might be you know large furniture pieces, or it might be what it's called in the antiques trade smalls. Um, and I think the most successful antiques dealers are the ones that know what their style is and stick to stick with their style and curate it and edit it because you know there are a lot of antiques and vintage pieces out there and what the expert can bring to it is is the edit so that the customer can understand and read the visual language mm. of that so how did you both get um what's your average day like oh. <laughs> if it was the same it would probably be, be quite helpful <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, please ease describe it. That'd be fun. It's triggering because, because where yeah. everybody else has been sort of lying on their sunbeds beds <laughs> drinking rosé every day during lockdown, listening to the birds singing and, you know, <gasps> chilling yeah. out with their families, Tamara and I have been headless chickens setting up a new business, which... <laughs> Um, Which we're very grateful for, but yeah, it has been very, intense. It has been um, intense. I think, what does our day look like? I mean, it can really vary. It, it depends what we're doing. If, if, we're, if we're at home, we can be styling our pieces um, to photograph them, to get online on our websites. We could be talking to our network of dealers to find specific pieces um, for a client. Uh, we could be... At, at fairs or markets from five in the morning, you know, walking around for nine hours, uh, collecting things. We could be driving three hours to drop things at customers. It really varies. Mm. Um, or we could daily. spend all day packaging and ringing packaging. each other saying, oh my God, I really hate yeah. packaging. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I mean, we, I suppose both of us try and say there may be a Monday is the day that we package everything and Tuesday right. may be the day that we go to a specific market that we like to but but it can vary really there's not a consistent I, th I think there are def definitely some markers I think the markers are you know if you've had if you've been online and you've done a, a kind of virtual sale then you know that you're going to spend the next two days packaging mm. if you know that Kempton or Ardingly or uh, Newark are on you know that you're going to be going to fairs if you know that you've got a client that needs something very quickly mm. then you know you're going to have to go out to your dealers or go to an antique center to try and find it it's i think one of the lovely things about it is it is pretty it's not routine no. varied yeah it's very varied but there's this sort of rich and pure seam of beautiful vintage and, and antique pieces that run through it and that's what carries you through the bubble wrap mm. i think also it can be uh, for, for ourselves and, and as we've got families as well um, because a lot of it is online and obviously there's a market globally. Um, so, you know, when you're packing up and thinking the day is finished in the UK, it's when all the American buyers are starting to come online oh, and look at things. So there can be a tendency if you don't put some kind of boundaries in to work constantly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially nowadays, uh, with yeah. the, like you say, with the internet. So, yeah network wise is it incredibly important to have a good network of dealers and shops and markets that know Absolutely. you and will give you good deals yes yeah mm. you, you have to be a people person you have mm. to like people you have to be able to tolerate people <laughs> <laughs> you have to be able to build relationships with people you have to be likable but you also have to be pretty commercial and savvy as well there's a balance yeah. there um i think there are increasingly more women in the industry but it is you know quite a male dominated business as well mm. has been you know you need to uh, there are there's the old school dealers who are can be quite tricky and then there's you know the new guys who it's it's a really varied but it's a bit like a family mm. there's a real sense I, I mean I worked in jewelry for years and it's a bit similar to that it's got a really traditional sort of feel to it but and it's all about the people to be honest Mm. how easy did you find it was to get into these networks 
you've got to get out there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's taken a number of years, mm. you know, you, and that's why the, the, the markets and the fairs are so important because it's the way of meeting people face to face and chatting and, and getting to know dealers and being in touch. And, you know, if you don't do that, uh, you can't build up relationships really. And you can't, and you meet, don't know who to go yeah. to. So for example, if, if we've got a client that wants art, we've got five dealers. We know we can message to say, can you please tell us what you've got in this, you know, uh, for example, I don't know, a large, um, floral piece framed from the mid-century mm. we'd be able to tell you or not tell you but we would be able to go and find a dealer that would be able to give us some options in that but if we hadn't spent years kind of tramping around fairs we wouldn't know yeah right yeah and that's invaluable when a, when a client comes to you and you've got that sort of network and knowledge base there already yeah yes so how has the internet sort of changed your industry are you even you you guys haven't been it for for a long long time but how has it changed the industry since you've been in it i think both of us i think we've come at it slightly differently because i think we've always used online i think we you know i, th I think we've both got really strong instagram accounts and that is a very visual platform and I think for the old school dealers and for some dealers that don't know how to use the kind of uh, the power of the internet, I can imagine it's quite intimidating. But mm. for us, it's just it's a, it's such a, an essential route to market. Mm. I think that's the thing. I think that there's still, you know, we can often meet dealers at markets who will have no online <laughs> presence. Um, you know, who won't even want to WhatsApp, for example, you know, they go, this is, this is where I sell and this is where you'll find me. Wow. <laughs> That's it. It can still happen. Not, not often, but it can still happen. But I think it's, it's changed monumentally in the last four months yeah. because as all the markets and fairs were shutting, I mean, they are reopened now, you know, in a, in a different socially distanced way, but as they were shutting, you know, people were panicking because there were many who were like, now what? But, but it has also helped a lot of dealers get into the online world and know that there are now different ways of selling. It, will, it won't ever take away that face-to-face -face market fair selling, but mm. it's now yeah, enough to come into a lot of what they do. Well, I mean, your um, uh, virtual uh, vintage fair certainly came online at the right time, didn't it? <laughs> Um, and it, it wouldn't have come, it wouldn't have happened without yeah. COVID because we wouldn't have done it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fair enough. So just just to give our listeners a bit of background, the virtual fair is there something like thirty five different dealers that all sort of you've come together um, and and show what what you've both got all got. No, no. So basically, what happened was we came out of a, we um, were at two or three fairs just before lockdown happened and literally about two days before lockdown happened we sort of we were at tomorrow's house and we were having a coffee and we just thought what we're going to do how are we going to find our stuff how are we going to source things for our clients for ourselves mm. um, and how are we going to how are some of those smaller dealers going to survive so we literally just went out through instagram um, and just said listen we're thinking about setting up an account we don't quite know how it's going to work. Are you interested? Just people we knew from the industry. Yeah. And, you know, probably 50 to 100 messages and 50 people said no and 20 people said yes and then another 10 people said yes and then we <laughs> just started. And it was chaos, to be honest. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, <laughs> we didn't know how to do it. And um, we assumed everybody knew how to use Instagram and they didn't. And um, but eventually it's, it's all worked out really well. And... And we did it, you know, just to sort of be supportive and create a community online that we knew we were going to miss in lockdown, really. And yeah. sorry, so technically how it works is we have one post in the morning, one post at, currently, this is how, the, how it works. One post in the morning, one post in the evening, every day. Um, and uh, each dealer kind of um, sets up a, a stand or a fair or, or a, to showcase their new stock. And then they... We, we direct the customers to their account and they buy or not, as the case may be. I just want to go uh, back slightly to uh, when we spoke about the average day and you talked about so many different aspects that uh, you guys have to deal with, such as photography, social media, um, 
walking around fairs and bargaining, being a salesperson. What, you know, it, it's a really big job in the fact that you've got to cover so many different roles that maybe in other industries, you just have one person doing that. Yeah, it's, it's very true. And it's, it's can, and I, and I think that's why it can be quite physically and emotionally tiring sometimes because you are switching between so many different roles uh, constantly. Um, you are. You are the social media expert, the photography expert, the um, styling expert, the styling expert, the the website expert, the back end of the website expert, the front end of the website. <laughs> <laughs> the vintage expert. Uh, you know, uh, it is. Yeah, it yeah. Is, yeah. can be very tiring, but um, it all comes as you know. You learn more and more as you do it every day, really. And it's part of the reason why tomorrow and I work together is because it can be quite lonely as well. Because you are a yeah you're an, uh, uh, a one person running essentially a, an end-to-end business and yeah. you know we, we we like working together yep what would be your biggest uh, positives you've taken out of the industry since you've been in it I think I feel really lucky to do something I love mm. actually I think I think I love I, I there's nothing like the buzz mm. of finding the most drop dead gorgeous piece and selling it on for a profit. Yeah. And I think, I think it's that combination of, and, and for me, I agree with that. And also going back to finding a piece that has been around for so many hundreds of years, mm. the stories behind it, being able to bring it into a modern home. I suppose it's also the sustainability of that piece, it, the beauty of it still in, in our modern times. It's creative. It's, it's creative. creative. It's, yeah. it's the whole thing is a joy. If, yeah. if you know, the whole thing is not a joy. <laughs> <laughs> the packaging is not a joy. <laughs> Have you, have you guys found a pickup of interest in the antiques world? Are, are you finding there's more customers out there and, and more interest in, in, that, in that world? I think it's much more accessible. I think yeah. now that it's online, I think, I think you don't have to have a, a completely vintage and antiques house. You know, yeah. you might just have... A, a centrepiece a, almost. Yeah, or, yeah. you know, you might have a... I'm currently looking at um, a cloche that Tamara's got. And, you know, or you might have an amazing um, oil portrait in a very modern setting. And I think, I think there's been a huge increase in an interest in interiors. And I think vintage and antiques fits within that kind of discipline or, or area of interest. And I think, I think people want to make their uh, homes unique and, and not purely from the high street. And I think bringing in vintage and antiques is a sustainable but interesting way to make your home unique. Um, so apart from the uh, packaging, um, what would be some of the less favourable aspects of, uh, of your career? Uh, getting up at half four to get to a fair, that's pretty yeah. Cool. Wow, yeah. yeah. Yeah, getting up at half, you know, there's, it's quite uh, physical, you know, you have, to, you have to carry a lot, you have to, we have a big trolley and we're pushing and pulling and trying to fit in as many things into it as we possibly can so i suppose that's I, the no, I know, no i love the packaging of the car at the end and oh, you're, no. you spend every single time going we're never going to get it all in and i'm like yes we are ultimate I tetris player yeah and i and i love it and every time i take a picture of her next to it and i'm like bloating <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah the early stars. and physically it's hard i mean in the winter when we do the fairs it's freezing it's cold it's, and we're out for like yeah. four five six hours in sub-zero temperatures oh yeah and but that's us buying the dealers yeah. who are selling have been there since three in the morning or two in the morning setting yeah. up or sleeping in their vans you know, <laughs> they have it even worse <laughs> yeah I do. We, we quite often say to each other we couldn't do that wow well, um, yeah so. i mean that that is uh it, it's a very physical very yeah. physical yeah. So we like to chat a bit about money on here, not too much. So we're just going to give you some average figures of, of what we've sort of researched that antiques dealers sort of a ballpark range for them. Um, and it was between 20 and 50 K. Now we know you're, well, most people are uh, assuming. Yeah, are, is that turnover or is that? Um... That was just average salaries. So whatever that would mean, but or you're all small businesses. So it must, it ranges wildly massively. Yeah. 
yeah i mean we don't have retail premises so right um, and we're not selling i mean a bit like the antiques industry is a food chain mm. and you know we're not at the top of the food chain and mm. we're not at the bottom of the food chain we're somewhere in the sort of you know nice comfortable middle bit Mm. Um, I think there's an expectation that vintage and antiques will be cheap and then not and they right. should be because there's you know a lot of skill goes into finding those pieces and um you know at the moment supply is really tough okay I think it also a sense it depends on what you sell you know if you're selling large pieces of furniture and um, more high-end items then you know you're probably in that higher bracket and more but if mm. you're selling smaller pieces and vintage pieces as opposed to antiques. pure antiques yeah. you know then it's going to be in the low and there's there's really quite a big spectrum of of what one sells and what one can make and the margin's quite tight yeah okay um what would be something that or is not in the job description we've already spoken about packaging and the early starts um <laughs> is there anything else that's probably uh not in the job description when you first signed up for this <laughs> Do we sign up? <laughs> what else? What are our other job descriptions? Um, I think living with your stock. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. We, we both have families who, I mean, f so for example, I was working at home today. Obviously, we're all working at home, but there was stock mm. all over the kitchen table. And I went down to the shed to get some and came back. And my son had ordered a McDonald's and was sitting there with chips and a burger right next to um a vintage um linen a piece of vintage <laughs> linen and i was like oh my god <laughs> step away from the table <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean i think our families have to be quite patient with us yeah. because you you live with it all the time which can be quite intense yeah, yeah. so how do you uh, sort of grow your reputation within the industry you've talked about going out and getting in fairs and whatnot how are you building your client bases is it all through social media or, or how, do, how are you doing it i think it's a it's a combination it's through social media and through personal recommendations of people who have used us um and and just our details getting passed on to uh you know from we we've sourced for a few restaurants i mean obviously that was before lockdown and the, the designers passed our information to other designers and then private clients with their homes i think they've just you know it's through a network like that mm -hmm. and not through social media i mean we do a lot we do a lot on instagram a lot yeah yeah mm. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll link your uh, your Instagram accounts when we put our post out. Um, so my, they're quite satisfying to go through. Actually, I was I found myself looking through them the other day. <laughs> um, it's quite um, a few of them. Yeah, they're they're really well curated. Actually, it's quite satisfying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so our favourite question we like to sort of ask towards the end is: Would you still go into the industry knowing what you know now? Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> brilliant well thank you both so much for your time we really enjoyed it and um we'll we'll speak to you again soon and uh sorry just quickly what are your instagrams uh accounts so everyone uh, as so we've got four is it four okay yeah. well, please just say, uh, you can say them if you want so i've got uh so my my main one for myself me um is vintage creator interiors um, I have another one called Vintage Creator House, which is um, my house in France. Um, we have our, we have two jointly, one of which is Your Antique Sourcing Studio. Um, then we have Virtual Vintage Fair, and Tamara has hers, which is Reclectic Vintage Interiors. So five. Wow. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll make sure we link them all in our Instagram post. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you both. Yeah, that's been great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you both. Thank you. Yes. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.